Professor al-Rashid belongs to a small circle of scholars who do not follow the official Saudi narratives on uh, the history and politics of the, the region, narratives that are often promoted, also promoted by Saudi Arabia's uh, allies and the economic interests that are bound up with the, uh, with the kingdom, especially the oil industry and the industry that has grown out of Aramco's interest in the uh, peninsula. She's very independent-minded, and uh, so independent-minded that uh, she has lost her passport. The Saudi authorities have withdrawn her passport. She is not, you know, doesn't have full citizenship because of, not of political activism, uh, but simply because of her, her scholarship. And moreover, there are uh, Saudis who have been arrested and imprisoned simply for uh, possessing her scholarly works. Now, she will speak tonight on the subject of uh, Saudi regional interventions in the Middle East, consequences for local societies. So without further ado, let us give a warm welcome to Professor Al-Rashid. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It's a pleasure to address you, and it's a very unusual uh, occasion for me. First, it's my first visit to Zurich, and also I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, CSI for giving me this opportunity to talk to you about my research and my work, and thank you to John, who organized uh, this trip, and it's been pleasant and pleasurable, actually, to be here. Um, what I propose to do today is to talk to you about uh, uh, one aspect of my research. Um, I have been looking at uh, uh, recently what had happened in the Arab world since the Arab uprising. Some people call them revolutions, others call them uprisings. Um, and uh, the role uh, Saudi Arabia had played in thwarting or supporting revolutions. So the title of my talk is uh, These Regional Interventions That Have Taken Place in the Middle East Over the Last Four Years, um, and What the Consequences Are on Local Societies. Um, the first thing I want to uh, look at is uh, the spectrum of events that have swept the Arab region. So the Arab uprising varied, but they had one common theme. Uh, regardless of how they started or the immediate causes that scholars have speculated about, what drove those uh, uh, uprising is still a question to be answered. Uh, there are hypotheses, but we really uh, focus on some uh, deep um, injustices that have taken place in the Arab world in the 20th century. The Arab uprising differed from every single uh, protest that the Middle East had witnessed because it brought what we call in academia mass politics. It was the mass protest that distinguished these uprisings from previous ones. However, they had multiple outcomes. And um, in North Africa, where it all started, in Tunisia, Egypt, and then Libya, um, we had uh, we witnessed, and I'm sure all of you have followed the uh, um, uh, the events day by day. Uh, I must say that there was a lot of hope at that moment, and I was one of the persons, uh, of the people who actually thought that we are witnessing something different. We're not in the age of coups masquerading as revolutions, such as what happened in the 1950s or 1960s. Even the Arabian Peninsula, which is uh, usually uh, regarded as a, a sort of a calm, quiet uh, region in the Arab world, we have seen serious protests in Bahrain, and even Oman uh, had witnessed uh, some protest movement. 
uh, in Yemen again, but this is not something new in Yemen because Yemen had distinguished itself by its uh, a strong society and weak state. Uh, Yemenis had always uh, uh, demonstrated and challenged central authority. But then we moved to Syria immediately after these uh, two uh, regions, uh, and uh, that is still an ongoing conflict. Um, so from the perspective of Saudi Arabia, they have never seen this before. What they have seen is multiple Arab leaders from Gaddafi to Jamal Abdel Nasser of uh, Egypt to Saddam Hussein challenging them using different ideologies, such as, for example, Arab socialism or Arab nationalism. And this was specific to the 1960s when the Saudi regime felt challenged by this mass protest in the Arab world that coalesced around these kind of ideologies. But the mass protests we witnessed in between 2010, uh, 2011, and onward was extremely different from this attempt in the Arab world to change the status quo. Um, so what we have... Uh, immediately after that, especially in places like uh, Tunisia and Egypt, is uh, the, the demand for elected governments. And this was extremely important. And we all know what happened when these Arab masses were given the opportunity to elect their governments in, in what was regarded as fair and open elections. We found that the rise of Islamists was actually the outcome especially in Tunisia with Al-Nahda party and in Egypt with the Muslim Brotherhood uh, gaining the majority of seats in these countries. Uh, there is a lot of speculation about why the Islamists have won, uh, ranging from the fact that they are uh, uh, more organized than any other group to the support they had in societies. But quite a lot of that enthusiasm for change, um, the uh, Islamist groups were true, they were the most organized, and it was almost a vote of protest of rejecting the status quo that existed before these open elections. Uh, from the perspective of Saudi Arabia, uh, the Saudi regime worried a lot about the loss of loyal allies in the Middle East, in the Arab world, specifically in Egypt. Saudi Arabia uh, almost uh, threatened, simply it felt that uh, Mubarak of Egypt was its closest ally and could not uh, see the Arab world without this close ally uh, immediately after uh, he stepped down um, in in, uh, in Egypt. Uh, so how did the Saudis respond to all this, uh, these events, the series of events, the multiple challenges that were taking place? The initial response, Saudi Arabia as a conservative uh, absolute monarchy abhorred change. And those of you who uh, are more familiar with European history uh, than myself would understand how monarchies usually respond to this kind of mass protest and upheaval. I could only comment on the uh, British responses throughout history when they w saw the French Revolution and what happened afterwards. But the initial response, uh, Saudi Arabia condemned the uprising and regarded them as chaos. And they used the word fitna in Arabic which means uh, challenging the status quo. And not only that, um, they, uh, they feared the transformation or the transformative character potential of this uh, uprising inside Saudi Arabia itself. Uh, one thing that uh, made the uprising so different in their impact from previous challenges in the 1950s or 1960s is basically the advent uh, and proliferation of images uh, and narratives about the uprising on social media. Saudi population is one of the most connected uh, population in terms of social media. And uh, they were watching for the first time a whole generation that had never seen peaceful protests in the Arab world had become familiar with, with the events that were taking place almost every day uh, between December 2010 and uh, 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 January and even uh, uh, after that. 
So uh, the uncertainty of the future, the main objective of uh, Saudi Arabia was to preserve the monarchy as a form of government, at least in the Arabian Peninsula first, and then later on outside the Arab region. The loss of allies such as Mubarak and Bin Ali, whom Saudi Arabia relied on for quite a lot of other political uh, reasons, intelligence. Um, and what worried Saudi Arabia about Egypt is the opening of the Egyptian public sphere uh, uh, immediately after the revolution. If you remember, there were quite a lot of protests against Saudi Arabia taking place in Egypt itself, which had never happened during the Mubarak regime because Mubarak would not have allowed it. And therefore, the, the most populous Arab country, Egypt, although it does not have any resources, is extremely important for Saudi Arabia because Saudis fear Egypt. Egypt, throughout the 20th century, brought Saudi Arabia three things. Uh, in fact, brought the Arab world. Mo modernity, Egypt was the outstanding pioneer in, the, in spreading modernity through literature, through cinema, art, etc., throughout the Arab world. The second one was Arab nationalism, which also worried Saudi Arabia, and Saudi Arabia felt that it was a threat. And finally, Egypt itself provided the ideologue for the Islamist movement. And therefore, these three trends worried Saudi Arabia and could not anticipate what would come out of Egypt, perhaps democracy, the fourth wave, and that was extremely worrying for the Saudi regime. Hence, all the efforts uh, uh, were directed toward uh, reversing the situation, and I will come to that. At home, uh, Saudi Arabia used uh, multiple strategies to actually uh, put the fences up against any kind of domino effect. Saudis became extremely um, uh, uh, active during that time. They engaged with these uh, uprisings in the Arab world and tried to comment like all of us outside the region, uh, and they had their supporters, and uh, uh, in a way, they tried to uh, limit the impact or the domino effect by resorting to religious discourse. And the Saudis uh, mobilized the religious establishment, the Salafi Wahhabi establishment, in order to uh, provide ideas and fatwas, religious opinions, against peaceful protest. So in the Saudi religious discourse, uh, there was a strong criminalization of civil disobedience, peaceful protest. That was regarded as something that is not allowed by religion. So if you are an activist and you go into the street, you are not committing a, a political act, you are committing a sin. You are committing a sin against God and the king. And therefore, the religious clerics uh, called ulama wanted to emphasize that um, obeying God, the prophet, and the king are on equal footing, which is a specific interpretation within the Salafi tradition, especially among the official religious scholars in Saudi Arabia. Therefore, if you are a protester or a civil rights activist, you're a sinner before you are a dissident. Also, they used all resources in order to, um, um, in a way, provide for the population and mitigate against any kind of protest. And it's interesting, uh, during that time, Saudis started tweeting and having hashtag activism. One of the hashtag activism during the Arab, the first months of the Arab uprising was uh, called Aratib la yakfi, which means the salary is not enough. So the protest moved from the street, because that became a criminal act if you demonstrate, to the internet. And this kind of activism uh, showed that they wanted uh, increase in their uh, salaries, which is similar to what happened in other Gulf countries, especially in the UAE and Qatar, uh, 
who had quite a lot of money and small population. They immediately increased the salaries of their citizens. And if you know that more than 60, 70% of the population find employment in the public sector, in government, then this is a, a good way to, in inverted commas, bribe the population into submission. So in addition to oil, they used this religious discourse, and then there was a ban, total ban on demonstrations. Um, now, in terms of talking about re regime politics, uh, from the perspective of the regime, the national interest privilege security. And this is the official discourse that uh, Saudis are told every day, it's better to be grateful for the security and the wealth that you have um, and uh, because change has a heart and there is no alternative to the ruling family in terms of providing economic and uh, economic benefits and security. So in order to uh, suffer this moment of mass protest in the Arab world, the Saudis used three strategies. One of the first one, let me start by containment. And this was the immediate reaction in Egypt and in Tunisia. Uh, they tried to limit the impact of this uprising in Egypt. And one would wonder if the uprising in Egypt led to the success of the Muslim Brotherhood in the country. Why would a country like Saudi Arabia, who that claims to rule according to God as an Islamic state, why would they object to the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood in a country like Egypt? I think my interpretation is the Muslim Brotherhood uh, demonstrated that they are willing to follow the rules of the democratic process. They are willing to form political parties adopt the discourse of democracy and engage in election and get to power. Now, we don't know what would have happened had they stayed in power, but they were uh, uh, taken out uh, by, uh, uh, by General Sisi, and therefore it's very difficult for us as academic and observers to see what will happen uh, after four years when they finish their... Uh, so why would this model of the Islamists threaten Saudi Arabia, who claims to be a Muslim country applying the Sharia Islamic law? Obviously, Saudi Arabia cannot stand the competition, cannot stand the fact that uh, uh, Islam and democracy can be combined. Because as you probably know, or most of you know, there is no kingship in Islam. Kingship doesn't, doesn't exist as a political system in Islam. Uh, and the Saudis want to have a monopoly over the application of Sharia. They cannot stand the fact that other countries may actually apply the Sharia. So in a way, this monopoly over Islam makes the Saudis unique in the Arab world and therefore gives the regime a legitimacy that we are the only Muslims in this world who apply the, uh, uh, the Sharia, who apply Islam. And therefore, to have another country so important like Egypt, at least demographically in the Arab world, and also intellectually, um, finding a way to marry Islam and democracy makes the Saudis feel threatened. So, in a way, the containment policies was to involve the starving of Egypt. So, uh, uh, the aid that Egypt used to receive from Saudi Arabia and other Gulf countries was suspended until after the coup uh, in, in the country. And then, the promise of more aid to Egypt started coming. So, in a way, the Saudi fear of openness in the most populous Arab country uh, and also the opening of the Arab public sphere in Egypt. Egypt still had a long history of uh, vibrant media that was suppressed during various dictatorships, but they had the seeds to be able to create some kind of openness in the Arab world that will definitely would have vibrated across the region. So it was important for the Saudis to contain Egypt through first uh, withholding aid and then 
pouring aid on Egypt in order to enforce the change. Um, and, and I talked about uh, how the fear of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, would uh, had uh, allowed Saudi Arabia to move very quickly in order to suppress any attempt to combine Islam with democracy. Second strategy was utter counter-revolution. And here, the first area where it actually happened was in Bahrain. Uh, again, the Saudi interest was to preserve the monarchy as a viable, durable uh, political system, at least in its backyard. They could not afford to see Bahrain uh, falling into the hands of democratic forces. And therefore, Saudi Arabia immediately, through the umbrella of the Gulf Cooperation Council, uh, sent its troops in order to support the Bahraini regime and to preserve the monarchy as a political system. The Bahraini uprising did start as a peaceful protest and continued to be so. In fact, it was one of the really unfortunate uh, uh, uprising in the Arab world. Bahrain had a long history of activism in, throughout the 20th century. And it had civil society, it had uh, trade unions. And in a way, uh, the uprising was not the uh, work of a particular sectarian group when it started. So the Bahraini protest consisted of youth who wanted serious change, uh, serious participation. They wanted an, uh, uh, an elected government. Um, but uh, And also the protesters initially included people from the Shia community, the majority, but also from the Sunnis. So for example, Wa'd, one of the uh, political, uh, not parties because parties are not allowed, but societies, political societies, um, they were participating in the Bahraini uprising together but the Saudis felt threatened by this mass protest only 15 kilometers away from Saudi Arabia. And also because the Bahraini uh, uh, uprising uh, after the 14th of February uh, 2011 started spilling over to Saudi Arabia, especially among the Shia community in the eastern province of the country. And uh, they supported, they demonstrated initially to call for their own rights, mainly equality with the Sunni majority, and also in order to uh, uh, ask for um, fair trials for political prisoners held uh, from among the community, and finally in support of their Shia brothers in Bahrain. Um, and this kind of event prompted Saudi Arabia to act as a counter-revolutionary force, especially in Bahrain. But this obsession with preserving monarchy uh, had to also be wider than the backyard of Saudi Arabia, especially in Morocco and Jordan, where Saudi Arabia also promised um, uh, uh, su financial support because both countries, Jordan and Morocco, were witnessing mass protests in order to protect the regimes. But more importantly, uh, Saudi Arabia proposed that the Gulf Cooperation Council is enlarged and uh, include Yemen and Morocco. So they, King Abdullah at the time of Saudi Arabia invited, um, uh, uh, asked uh, to the Gulf uh, Council to include these two countries. Well, this never happened, um, uh, but the financial support continued. And finally, uh, as a counter-revolutionary force, used uh, diplomatic channels to influence, for example, the Yemeni uprising. And here, uh, it was a counter-revolution, but disguised as negotiation. So Saudi Arabia, through uh, with Qatar and other Gulf Cooperation Council uh, countries, uh, went into the Yemeni situation, which wasn't unusual for Saudi Arabia, as Saudi Arabia had always interfered in Yemen. In fact, the interference goes back to the 1930s, uh, when Saudi Arabia had always meddled with domestic Yemeni politics by either supporting uh, uh, tribal chiefs against each other or against the government or supporting the government against other groups. So the intervention was there, and the main purpose was to keep Yemen weak uh, and in fact, they kept it so weak that it generated more trouble 
than uh, actually would have uh, been uh, possible to contain. So counter-revolution as negotiation, which resulted in the, um, uh, in the Yemeni president at the time, Ali Abdullah Saleh, being removed from uh, uh, power, but also given immunity. If you remember, he escaped after he was attacked to Saudi Arabia. He was given uh, treatment after his injuries, and then he returned to Yemen with this immunity from being uh, put on trial. Um, and we see how this has actually developed into what we see now, uh, uh, currently in Yemen. And the third one would uh, be surprised that the Saudi regime acted as a revolutionary force as well. A conservative monarchy also wanted to become revolutionary, but only, only selectively and in specific cases. So we have uh, Saudi Arabia backing a revolution. And here, the, the example that comes to mind is Syria. So Saudi Arabia, conservative monarchy with no democracy, no election, no uh, uh, parliament, is actually supporting Syrians to uh, ask to depose Bashar al-Assad and establish democracy in Syria, which is very, very unusual. And there are big reasons for that. So uh, an undemocratic government uh, uh, supporting uh, demands for uh, uh, elections and democratic change. Um, especially in, in Syria. And the reason for this is very straightforward. Uh, Syria became a, a proxy area for a war, a regional war between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Now, Saudi Arabia, if you remember, uh, had supported uh, the Assad regime before. And it wasn't until the 2006, 2008 that the two fell out of, with each other. Uh, simply Bashar al-Assad, uh, during the Israeli um, bombing of Lebanon after uh, Hezbollah uh, kidnapped the Israeli soldiers in 2008, seven, eight, uh, six probably, sorry, um, um, Bashar uh, used uh, provocative language against the Saudis and called them half men. And in a patriarchal society, that is really very, very upsetting. <laughs> no man in the Arab world would like to be called half a man. But this is just uh, really the, the joke. The main thing, uh, Saudi Arabia had a vested interest uh, after 2003 to limit Iranian expansion in the Arab world. And they saw uh, the the uh, increased expansion of Iranian power in Iraq after the American invasion as a threat. And uh, in addition, uh, they have lost control of Lebanon, especially with the rise of Hezbollah in Lebanon. So today, the Saudis cannot count on a pro-Saudi government in Beirut after what happened to the Hariri family. And therefore, uh, Syria became the bridge that links Iran to Lebanon. And also, from very early on, uh, both Mubarak, uh, before he was deposed, uh, the Saudi king and the Jordanian king started talking about this Shia crescent. Saudi Arabia lobbied the United States to attack Iran, but obviously Obama resisted, and that didn't happen. And if you remember the WikiLeaks leaks, which said, uh, which uh, um, talked about a letter by uh, the Saudi king telling the American administration, Obama in particular, to cut the snake's head, meaning Iran. So there was this regional rivalry uh, between Saudi Arabia and Iran, but Saudi Arabia would not dare attack Iran directly, so unfortunate for the Syrians, Syria itself became the playground where these two regional powers, in addition to others, of course, Turkey and um, uh, other Gulf countries, had played a very, very destructive role. So the intervention of uh, a regime like Saudi Arabia with its oil resources had led to the increased militarization of the uprising. And this is not to undermine the atrocities committed by the Assad regime against the people in Syria. Uh, they started their uh, demonstrations as uh, peaceful protesters, copying the Egyptian fun uh, demonstrations of uh, Tahrir Square and other places, but it immediately turned very, very uh, bloody and continues until the present day. 
So civil war now, in terms of uh, change, uh, it, it is unlikely that we will see this resolve very quickly. In fact, it's getting worse and worse. The death toll is incredible. And the final refugee cr crisis, which also resulted from that kind of uh, uh, regional intervention. Mainly, the Saudi-Iranian rivalry has proved to be detrimental to Arab society. Um, so, to just sum up what I have so far talked about is Saudi regional intervention took the form of uh, diplomacy through initially, so for example, there were multiple conferences, international conferences in which Saudi Arabia participated, such as Friends of Syria, Geneva 1, 2, 3, etc., through the UN uh, uh, also and through the Arab League, in order to contain and suffocate change, or to uh, uh, ally the Arab regimes uh, behind the Saudi policy against, for example, the Syrian regime in that case. The military intervention uh, so far, it was uh, uh, direct in Bahrain with sending ground troops and also indirect through sponsoring uh, uh, rebel groups of different political uh, persuasions. Also, they use the finance. Saudi Arabia is a well-endowed country with oil resources despite the uh, decrease in oil prices recently. Uh, so oil wealth was used to suppress the uprising in, in Saudi Arabia, specifically in some uh, pockets, um, as Saudi Arabia did not see the same kind of mass protest that we saw in the Arab world. What we saw is pockets of protest, for example, among the Shia in the eastern province and also in the central part of Saudi Arabia, when uh, among Sunni Muslims who started demonstrating, requesting that uh, their political prisoners have uh, um, uh, fair and open trials. Uh, and in addition to the old strategy of uh, bribing uh, loyalists. Finally, there was the most sinister impact of this intervention, and this is the sectarianization of conflict. And we see it happening in three contexts, in Bahrain, in Syria, and in Yemen. So from the Saudi political perspective, uh, and also from the perspective of the Saudi religious scholars who are supporting the government and have quite a lot of wide access and, and also com convincing the population. These political uprisings were seen through the prism of sectarianism. So in Bahrain, the Saudi officials, uh, especially the religious establishment, saw the Bahraini uprising as a Shia conspiracy backed by Iran against the Sunnis. And therefore, uh, an uprising that started for uh, calling for democracy, uh, respect of human rights, dignity, justice, had completely changed in the official discourse in order to undermine the uprising in Bahrain. So by calling it a Shia uprising, um, and it didn't help when uh, some sections of the Shia population started raising flags of Iran or photos of uh, Iranian scholars. Um, now, there is a big question mark about why they did that, but that's not really the, the, the purpose of the talk. In Syria also, what started as a, a democratic movement wanting to... Um, uh, have more rights, dignity, etc., like the other uprising, was turned into a sectarian war now. And from the Saudi perspective, they see the battle in Damascus as a, 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 a religious war of uh, the oppressed Sunnis against the Alawite, um, who are regarded as Shia uh, minority that had ruled over them. So there is no more room for political discourse about rights, civil society, elections, representation. All the conflict is seen through the prism of Sunni-Shia divide. And in Yemen, which actually, surprisingly, is one of those countries where sectarianism wasn't a great issue in Yemen. Yemen, like other Arab countries, is diverse at the level of ethnic and, uh, and religious uh, sect, 
but it is not as polarized as other Arab uh, countries. And today, the intervention of Saudi Arabia in Yemen through the airstrikes that had been taking place since March is seen by some Saudi religious scholars as a religious war of the Sunni against the Houthis who are Zaydis. And the fact that the Zaydis are not like the Iranian 12er Shiites is just beyond the point. They are all grouped together as Shia. So even the Alawis, uh, who are Shia, but some people would say they're not mainstream Shia, and they're definitely not like the Iranian Shia, are all uh, regarded as one group, and uh, uh, the, the battles are now religious battles between sectarian groups. So what happened as a result of all these strategies that I have outlined? Local consequences. So the political outlook of these countries where there had been Saudi intervention, either diplomatically, financially, or militarily. First, suppression of peaceful protest and the demise of democratic forces in the Arab world. There is no doubt today in countries like Egypt, in, in Bahrain, in other places, there is no room today for democratic forces because the context is so polarized, so sectarian, that those who have some kind of democratic ideas have been sidelined completely or marginalized. Islamist groups who are part of, whether we like it or not, they are part of the fabrics of Arab society. The moderate ones, and there are moderate ones, and in fact, if you read this book uh, that uh, I have just published, it shows that some of them are willing to engage with democracy in some way or another. Uh, they're not liberal Democrats. They might be religious, conservative Democrats, but we can't always judge those people by our own standards. They, we don't expect them to be uh, products of parliaments uh, in the West. So we have to judge their experience and their discourse by some kind of criteria that is not a duplicate of what we know. So, for example, to just give you an example, when people say, oh, well, the, the, in the media, you must have heard, like, there are liberal Saudis, yeah? So believe me, I have not met a liberal Saudi yet. <laughs> if you think liberalism is uh, what you know of liberalism, yeah? There are some Saudis who want some kind of personal freedoms, but I haven't met a liberal yet who wants to an uh, elected parliament, for example. Yeah, so a liberal, Saudi liberal accepts. What they want is limitation on the powers of the religious uh, authorities to interfere in their personal life. That's what they want, which is a right. That's what they want. Uh, but they're not the mainstream. They do not constitute a very big cohort of activists. Uh, in terms of the Islamists, there is a wide range of Islamists, ranging from the most radical, violent, but you can be radical, non-violent. And the history of Europe tells us that you can. There are lots of radicals who were tolerated, but they were not violent. As long as they don't use violence, uh, you know, they can exist in society. And in a liberal democracy, there is room for those radicals who are not violent. <clears throat> But after what happened in Egypt, that trend has actually uh, uh, become fragmented and perhaps it pushed some of those members uh, towards taking more radical uh, views and strategies. So this Saudi intervention had detrimental if impact on the political outlook of the Arab world. The rise of militant Islamists who are now uh, basically uh, filling a vacuum. There's no room for a peaceful protest anymore, but what we have found that power and those who have the means of coercion, those who can terrorize the population are gaining ground. And the classic example is IS. So if you have no means of coercion, you're actually uh, not listened to. If you flex your muscles, you use weapons, you are the one who are 
who is uh, on the ground and can gain territory. Uh, the intervention has uh, also the potential of prolonging military conflict and fueling dissent, and the classical case is Syria. It's been going on for five years, and without the regional intervention from both sides, um, we would not, we would have probably made a, dif uh, made a difference in terms of people who are living under um, the, uh, uh, the threat of war, they may be able to compromise. But once you uh, uh, have people, regional powers, deciding on the outcome of this war, specifically the Saudis have made it clear that they would not accept anything but deposing Bashar al-Assad. And therefore, negotiation, diplomacy tends to be lost in this kind of regional polarization. Politically also, the Arab world uh, has become more uh, polarized. Uh, the middle ground is lost. There, uh, you, you cannot be a neutral person anymore in the Arab world. I find it myself that if you, um, uh, for example, just yesterday, uh, one of the Ismaili mosques in southern Saudi Arabia, the Ismailis again counted as Shia, but they're different from Shia in Iran or in Iraq. There's some in Syria and in Egypt, but they are much smaller uh, minority. If you sympathize with their dead, they immediately say, oh, but what about the Sunnis who are dying in Syria? So you cannot be neutral anymore. Uh, you cannot uh, actually experience your humanity in support of the dead, whatever religion or sect they are. The situation is so polarized that you, you have to take side. And it's very uh, difficult for people to remain neutral. And also, the Saudis want to dictate the outcome of uprising, such as the one taking place in Syria, uh, the removal of disloyal regime as the ultimate goal. It's, it becomes very difficult to reach a negotiation or to reach some kind of compromise. The language of compromise, the language of diplomacy is lost as a result of this increased polarization. Now, economically, we all have seen what has happened in, in, uh, in the Arab world as a result. Very weak economies that had already uh, been impoverished, and they actually uh, became worse. Um, and there is a serious issue, and that is the increased dependency of many Arab regimes on aid from Saudi Arabia and other Gulf countries, provided that they remain loyal and join in. Today, this, uh, uh, since these airstrikes on Yemen, Saudi Arabia has been very, very uh, uh, interested in getting Egypt to send troops so that they could send them <laughs> to Yemen. But General Sisi, uh, although he has actually taken a lot of aid from Saudi Arabia, has resisted sending masses uh, of, of troops on the ground to Saudi Arabia, probably rightly so. It doesn't want to be uh, uh, the victim. Uh, I mean, he, he has enough problems in Egypt to deal with. Uh, but there is always a cost to this aid that Saudi Arabia gives under the pretext of, of helping other Muslims or helping other Arabs. Um, and loyalty to the Saudi regime and lack of uh, loss of de independence becomes a critical issue. So economically, uh, this is a very uh, difficult situation for receiving countries, countries who receive aid. The destruction of uh, uh, infrastructure in conflict zone is massive. I mean, Syria, uh, Yemen now uh, is extremely, uh, 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 it will take probably generations to rebuild these economies and the infrastructure. Unemployment had already been extremely difficult in the Arab world, and it is one of the highest regions in the world that it experiences uh, high rates of unemployment, and it is even worse now. Well, there is also what I call the lost generation, and I've seen this lost generation vividly um, in one case of children, especially Syrian refugee children who had moved to Lebanon, and I saw them a couple of months ago, uh, 
uh, very, very young children who are actually working as porters in supermarkets, carrying people's shopping with them uh, to their cars in order to get uh, 2,000 Lebanese pounds, which is like nothing. Um, and those pe children are take, have no schooling at all. Somebody at age uh, seven, eight, stops, uh, uh, doesn't even start education. What will happen in 10 years? They will be illiterate. And probably after the mass education wave in the Arab world in the 1950s, when all regimes started mass education, uh, the illiteracy began to decline in the Arab world. But now we have a lost generation. And this lost generation will be illiterate in the 21st century, I think, for the first time. The social impact. Uh, it's extremely important to see when the Saudi expansion, whether it's uh, religiously, uh, whether economically, politically, etc., has an impact on gender and gender inequality. The Saudi model of gender segregation, of uh, having women take the back seat in, in terms of uh, empowerment, employment, education, all these kind of inequalities are now the common model in the Arab world. And they are advertised as the true Islam. But it is a Saudi Islam, it is a Saudi model that has become popular in other Arab countries. Uh, as a result of media, uh, satellite channels, as a result of religious education books that are uh, sponsored and sent around the world. So the Saudi model, which was very specific to the context, both cultural and geographic, of the Arabian Peninsula, it's a minority sect, if you like, has become the norm. And any other form of being Muslim has become difficult to exercise. You either follow the Saudi model of being a Muslim, or you are branded as a non-Muslim. So it's become very, very difficult. Harassment and marginalization of women who are actually daring to challenge these norms, these new gender norms and inequality, is, has increased as a result of that, simply because the societies where the Saudi model has penetrated are not used to this kind of uh, gender inequality. In fact, their women, if you took a, take a country like Tunisia or North Africa, Egyptian women and, and other women, uh, countries, women had to work in order to earn a living. It was not a luxury. It was a necessity. And if you have religious discourse propagating that the play, right place for a woman is to stay at home, then there is actually a, a clash there. And it's creating this kind of harassment. We see more harassment of women in the streets. And uh, uh, mainly uh, with this Saudi model popularized and became the norm, we have greater intolerance for social diversity and pluralism. Now let me look at uh, religious, religious groups. Obviously, uh, one of the beauties of the Middle East, I think, of the Arab world was its ethnic and religious diversity. Um, and this is completely um, a unique situation. Um, European countries had been more homogeneous. But this religious diversity where ethnic groups and religious groups lived together, I don't want to uh, think in terms of nostalgia to a past when everybody was happy, Christians and Muslims living together. That would be a, a historical uh, error. But like all diverse societies, you have a historical moment when there is conflict between communities and peace. So let's not kid ourselves and say before uh, all this had happened, people were happily together, marrying into each other's communities. No, it's not true. As a scholar, I have to look at the historical fact. There were massacres, there were purification purges. But what has been different this time is that the sectarianization. Today, political conflicts that would have been resolved politically become religious conflicts. Yeah? And this is something uh, 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 that is leading to entrenched divide between 
two, the two branches of Islam, the Sunnis and the Shia. Uh, now, some people think that, oh, but Sunnis and Shia have always hated each other, and it goes back to the seventh century. No, it's not true. There are moments when the religious identity is politicized on both sides. Both the Shia and the Sunnis politicize their religious identities in order to gain some kind of equality or benefit, etc. But what we have seen now is sectarianization is the only way to promote your cause, whether you're a Sunni or a Shia. Other religious minorities, and I think this would be an interest to your, uh, uh, to some of you in this audience, the intolerance of religious minorities. Now, one thing about Saudi Arabia is had, it has always been predominantly Muslim. The only Christian communities who are living there are immigrants, uh, mainly from other Arab countries, Lebanese, Syrian, etc., or from Asia or from the West. And I'm sure you're aware that they live under great restriction in terms of practicing their religion. Um, I remember uh, I was doing research on uh, immigrants in London uh, several years ago. And I went to a center where uh, Filipino women who come with their employers to London um, who are, uh, and then escape. They are called Filipina runaways. So they run away simply because their salaries are small. They come to London. They want to be independent. They, they run away from their families that brought them. And they go to this shelter in West London that is under the, protect, uh, the guidance of some lawyers and human rights activists. First, they need to get their passport back because the employer retains the passport of the um, uh, Filipino domestic worker. Now, some of them tell stories. I went and interviewed them about uh, one of them. She said that she was a Christian, Filipino, Catholic, um, and she would hide her cross uh, in her suitcase really uh, uh, well guarded because if her employer saw it, he would destroy it or not allow her to do that. So these kind of, and also there's another story which was really important, and this is what happens to those people when they die in Saudi Arabia. Um, Catholics from Goa, Filipinos from the Philippines, from other countries, uh, they have no way to hold uh, a ceremony for the dead. And this really affects the very, very uh, you know, poorly paid domestic workers or, or wor manual workers in Saudi Arabia, the expatriate community. I have heard stories about some of them who say that what they do is they cannot raise enough money to repatriate the body, and their uh, embassies would not pay the cost of it, and the people, the parents, the families in the Philippines or in India could not pay for the body to be brought back. So what they do is a group of them would go to the desert and bury their dead there if somebody dies, simply because they're not allowed to have the religious uh, ceremony, the churches, the uh, the support. And this is an inhuman situation that needs to change. But with this uh, Saudi in strong intervention in the Arab world, I think religious minorities uh, in countries that had always lived with religious minorities is an alien concept in Saudi Arabia. The diversity of the Arab world is not actually um, a, a lived experience. Um, I remember, I, I grew up in Saudi Arabia, and there was this sort of, um, in the 60s and 70s, uh, you know, we never heard the word Shia, believe it or not. It's just not in our horizon, although there's like 10% of the population was Shia. And um, we confused them with Shiuri, which is communist. <laughs> in fact, there was a reason why. It's simply because uh, the Shia in the eastern province were the first people who um, uh, got recruited into the oil company Aramco. And they fell under the influence of socialist and communist ideas in the 1950s and 60s. And therefore, the Shia were Shiuri. And in fact, in Iraq itself, quite a lot of them were communists. <laughs> So uh, the first time I came across a Shia was in Lebanon, because I've never seen a Shia 
and there were these stories about the Shia as they're different, etc. So what I, the point I'm making here is religious, if you are in Riyadh, religious difference is not a lived experience. The only religiously different person is going to be an immigrant whom you socialize with only in the context of work. So it's not a, a, a kind of diverse society. This is how it is. And therefore, this religious diversity in the Arab world is, is extremely difficult to understand. Um, what we have seen also is uh, throughout this last, uh, the last decade is the increased migration, out migration of religious minorities from the Palestinian Christian community uh, under Israeli occupation to the Lebanese, the Syrian, the Iraqi Assyrians. Uh, and I remember I was talking to John about my research, which I did in the 1990s, on the Iraqi Assyrians. Uh, they're called Ashuris. Uh, so they belong to Eastern Christianity. And I was interested in their story. Why did they end up in London? Uh, so the, 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 the um, um, plight of that particular group um, date back centuries, but to d they were uh, existing in Iraq, and they were vibrant communities. And today, we find that the migration uh, is taking uh, a, a, a speedy outcome uh, as they try to leave, which is a loss to the Middle East, to the Arab world, uh, to lose that religious diversity. And there is a greater pressure to homogenize religious outlook. Today, if you are different, whether you are religious or not, you, you are criminalized. Religious differences are criminalized as a result of that um, kind of uh, pressure to become, uh, to uh, homogenize Muslims, to begin with and reject um, different religious groups. Now, we come to the solutions. I'm sorry I painted a very dark picture, but uh, we have to really look at the empirical uh, uh, facts and see, and not sort of entertain uh, illusions, I think. I think quite a lot of damage to the Arab world has taken place as a result of the regional rivalry between Saudi Arabia and Iran. What I've uh, uh, sketched is, uh, uh, I don't want to blame it on Saudi Arabia only, because there is a political conflict going on between Saudi Arabia and Iran, and we must look at that in order to understand all the negative consequences that I have outlined. Uh, in order to understand what had happened to the Arab uprising, in order to understand why the Arab world has degenerated into the state of chaos and bloodshed, now we have to understand this rivalry. Um, again, also there is an inter another international rivalry going on between the US and Russia. And uh, as a result of that, we find that there is greater polarization. Uh, since the Second World War, uh, the United States became the hegemonic force, really, with only small other regimes, very limited number of regimes uh, that were uh, um, uh, opposed or had a distance uh, between themselves and the United States, for example, in Libya, in um, uh, Syria, um, and in Iraq before 2003. But I think um, uh, in addition to the Iranian-Saudi uh, Cold War, which is not really cold, it's very hot, and it's, it has led to quite a lot of damage, uh, we find that there is another one ongoing between the U.S. and Russia that creates this kind of polarization. Um, the uh, new development that is worrying from the uh, Saudi regime is its ability and empowerment to engage in direct military intervention, which is very new. Uh, it's a change of foreign policy of Saudi Arabia and through airstrikes. Um, uh, if you remember during King Abdullah, there was a talk about Saudis being able to strike. But he's never actually dared to strike anybody except through proxies. But now with the new king, we find that there is a more vigorous attempt for domestic reasons. I could discuss that later, why uh, Saudi Arabia has moved from being um, uh, 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 from not being able 
or willing to use the military to this shift and becoming more boisterous um, after several decades of being armed by various Western p powers from Switzerland, I heard this morning, to the United States. So the pouring of these weapons, the empowering of the Saudi regime uh, has allowed it to uh, buy military technology and training, basically. Most of Saudi's uh, 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 training is done by Western powers. And the argument that I heard in London when we challenge Western government is why do you uh, keep selling arms to regimes that are uh, so dictatorial, who abuse human rights, and who might actually generate a counter-radical Islamist trend, like what we have seen. Um, they say, well, in an open market of weapons, if we don't sell them, then the French would sell them. That's what I hear in London. I'm not sure if the Swiss are selling arms to the Saudis, um, whether they would, somebody else would sell them, definitely. But dealing with these issues is, is beyond the region, the Arab region, and perhaps there is a scope for uh, a, a global um, solution to armament uh, that uh, is uh, actually creating this chaos in the Arab world. And so far, the strikes have no positive outcome. Uh, seven months into bombing the poorest Arab country, mainly Yemen, we have not seen uh, a kind of solution. In fact, it made the country more polarized and with no infrastructure and with famine, with, uh, with serious human humanitarian crisis. Uh, not to mention the increase in militarization and radicalism across the Arab world. So finally, I think uh, the, the persistent uh, Saudi model of government, uh, religious outlook, and social and cultural norms have been enhanced as a result of the uh, empowering of the Saudi regime through also the support of its Western allies. There is an increased polarization of the Arab world that has actually uh, removed scope for any democratic forces to emerge in the immediate future. Perhaps with some time, then we are going to see a change, but I can't see it at the moment, as long as the Saudi regime is intact and well endowed with economic resources, that it could project its power outside Saudi Arabia. So I think the real change should happen in Saudi Arabia itself, and we may actually see some kind of change happening. The increased dependency of local economies on Saudi wealth uh, with important consequences for the country itself, Saudi Arabia, and the region. With a uh, decrease in oil prices, Saudi Arabia is going to face a serious problem. Um, and uh, that will have uh, implications for domestic spending whether they can actually maintain the subsidies, the, well, the redistribution of wealth, uh, and it's also facing a rising uh, uh, number of youth who are educated, who are in need of jobs. So whether they are going to maintain the spending at the domestic level and continue to finance wars outside Saudi Arabia is, is, uh, uh, remains to be seen. The, I think finally what we are witnessing as a result of uh, all this is the rise of religious nationalism, which is extremely dangerous. Because nationalism in the Arab world tried to homogenize people from different ethnic religious groups. It was a, a complete disaster because it was linked with dictatorship. So you can't force people to unify under dictatorship. They might unify at the superficial level, but uh, uh, nationalism with dictatorship is extremely dangerous. It, it could use to genocide and all sorts of other things, which had happened in some parts of the uh, uh, Arab world. But what we are seeing now is probably worse than that sort of Arab secular nationalism, and it is religious nationalism. And here, religious minorities will be the first victim 
because religious nationalism tried to homogenize people's beliefs, people's practices of their faith. So even if you're a Sunni Muslim, you don't practice like the Saudis, you're going to have some problems. That alone if you're a Christian or uh, Yazidis. Or, um, so religious nationalism, I think, is, is emerging in the Arab world at the moment with this increased polarization, and it will have detrimental effect on peace and harmony. Uh, and I think nobody is actually going to be safe from that because today in a global world with the increased movement of people that we might have the same kind of tension arising in places that are not Arab, mainly in Europe and in other places. And thank you for your patience. Thank you.